Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is actually the very first of our MAMNA Coast to Coast virtual seminar series. Uh, and so as it looks like in the States that, uh, unfortunately, but somewhat self-inflicted, uh, it looks like we're not going to be uh, getting to see each other at conferences anytime soon. Uh, and so this is a way for uh, not just the Mid-Atlantic community uh, to get to see what we're all working on, but uh, hopefully to stretch things out a little bit uh, from coast to coast. And so Heidi, who do we have for today? So we're very fortunate to have Professor Mike Saylor from UC San Diego. He's a distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry um, and a lot of other roles. I will list some off. He's the co-director of the UC San Diego Institute for Materials Discovery and Design. He holds affiliate appointments in the bioengineering, nanoengineering, and material science and engineering departments at UCSD. He was trained as a chemist. Um, he received his bachelor's from Harvey Mudd, which still blows my mind, uh, and a PhD from Northwestern. He began his academic career, career at UCSD in 1990. Um, and now he's a distinguished professor since 2015. He was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and the National Academy of Inventors. Inventors. He was named a highly cited researcher by Clarivit Analytics in 2018 and 2019. And something that's kind of reflected on all of this, but not written, is that Mike is an excellent teacher. So I really like hearing him talk and I like listening to him in the lab. It's always very entertaining and informative. So Mike, the floor is yours. Let's see what you have to present. Uh, thanks. And thanks, Ryan and Heidi, and welcome to everybody virtually. Um, just to get started, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, university requires, and it's appropriate that I give just a quick conflict disclosure of these are all the companies that I uh, I'm involved with, and uh, one of the companies that I'm not involved with is this company uh, uh, listed here that works on a Braxane. And this is basically my introductory slide here. Um, if you look at this, this is taken from a website. If you don't know it, a Braxane is an anti-cancer drug. Uh, really, if you look at the website, you won't find anything there that says nano on it, but in fact, it is a nanotechnology in fact, nanomedicine has been around uh, so long that some of the early nanomedicines are now off patent. Uh, Abraxane, that particular um, <clears throat> system is a nanoparticle made out of albumin, a you know, colloid of, of serum albumin, uh, and then embedded inside that uh, little nanoparticle is paclitaxel, which is a, an anti-cancer drug. And this is used uh, uh, in treating breast cancer. Um, the reason I bring this up is I think it's a good uh, model for what I like to call uh, nano robots. Um, and this kind of goes back to if any of you guys are science fiction fans, which I am, uh, some of the early uh, novels of Isaac Asimov, uh, or maybe you saw the movie called I, Robot. Um, <clears throat> in, those, in that novel, uh, Asimov had his laws of robots, which basically were programmed into the robots. And so they all went around and did good things, not bad things. Um, and the, the three laws for the robot were given here, and it, it just comes out of the book. Um, you know, a robot can't injure a human being, it can't, uh, it must obey its orders, and it also must protect, you know, provided that everybody else is happy and healthy, then it must protect itself. Uh, and if you think about then what I, the image I showed in the last slide, which is basically a nanoparticle, I like to think about those things as, again, what I call nano robots. And so for a nano robot, um, you really have different rules. And these are laws that I kind of made up. Uh, one, uh, the first one being that the nano robot has to have no toxicity. Uh, and so it can't be harmful to human beings. So it kind of maps from the uh, Isaac Asimov's uh, law, first law. Um, the second uh, law is that uh, the, the robot should respond to its orders, and that's true for uh, nanomaterials too. And what you're gonna find is that unlike uh, robots uh, in the macroscopic world, you know, where you, they follow lines of code that you write in the computer keyboard, um, the programming lines of code that we put into our nanosystems are really done with chemical reactions and using chemistry. And so it's a chemical programming, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then finally, uh, the nanorobot should not protect its own, uh, <clears throat> uh, its own safety. And at, at some point, 
all of these materials are really should be designed to go away and, and self-destruct. What I mean by that, actually, if you look again back at Abraxane as this, this prototypical nanotherapeutic, it actually follows all of those laws. You know, it's it's except for the fact that the paclitaxel is, is a very toxic anti-cancer drug, um, the carrier itself is not harmful. And so you don't have what we call off-target effects. Uh, it follows its programming. Uh, in the case of Abraxane, I won't go into details of that. It, it basically localizes to breast tumors via a phenomenon known as the EPR effect. Uh, and finally, it, it, the last, that third law is it does self-destruct. The albumin being a naturally present in our bloodstream, uh, our body knows how to handle that material, degrade it, and make it go away when it's off, after it's already delivered its therapeutic dose. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something that kind of tracks a little bit beyond uh, the early stages of nanotechnology. You look at things, some things like Abraxane and, and Doxel, a number of the other uh, nanotherapeutics, they all focused on treating cancer. And um, that's great. Uh, and probably the reason for that was cancer is a very you know, uh, dire uh, disease. Uh, if people get sick with cancer, uh, they don't, a lot of times they don't have many options. And so the safety profile of nanotechnology was not really proven out 20 years ago. Um, you really had to go after diseases where the plan B is that the patient's gonna die. Uh, now what we're seeing really an evolution in nanotechnology is that nanomedicine uh, is now starting to be deployed in other areas uh, in disease situations like uh, um, antibiotics where uh, the patient may not necessarily die and they may actually have to survive after the treatment, they may have 70 more years of life left to go. So you have to design your materials with that self-destructing concept. Really, that part becomes really important. Um, so it, um, we're going to talk about antibiotic uh, or uh, treating bacterial infections. Uh, some of what I'm going to talk about today also really does map pretty well to coronavirus. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. But if you kind of contrast what the investment has been uh, in antibiotics uh, and treating bacterial infections uh, in uh, you know, the modern world uh, with cancer, uh, you see the chart on the, on the uh, right here, lower right here kind of gives a comparison. Uh, just the number of drugs that are in pipeline for cancer is much, much greater uh, than the number of antibiotic uh, therapeutic uh, drug products that we have in the pipeline. The investment's much greater for cancer. Uh, and the, even, I don't have the number here, but the pharma VC investment, either in the, in the government side or the commercial side, uh, is much more extensive in cancer than it is for antibiotics. And so this is really a, a critical need. Uh, and so what can nanotechnology uh, have bring to bear on that problem? So I, I'm gonna talk specifically about bacterial infections. And this is just a simple example from a, taken from a literature of a mouse uh, infection model, various different, uh, uh, regions of the body that are being infected here. And so this is just a, a kind of ex example, if you will, the, the lymphocytes and the neutrophils and the macrophages, those, those larger blue objects in the image are supposed to represent the body's immune cells, the cells that the immune system deploys to fight off infections naturally. The little purple dots are supposed to be a bacterial infection, Staph aureus. I'm gonna be talking specifically about uh, lung infections. I'm gonna give a few examples really focusing on this lung infection problem. And um, what's shown here in the, uh, the, the um, bottom of the chart, there is a, a typical, what we call it, survival curve. Um, basically uh, how many animals are surviving uh, as a function of the days after they get infected. And this is an example, just kind of notional example of a lung infection uh, coming from a, a you know, bacterial lung infection in a mouse. Uh, when the mice are originally infected, they survive for a few days and they start getting sick and then eventually they die off. Um, and that's typical for lots of diseases. But um, with, uh, with some diseases like uh, bacterial infections, you, know, you have this case where you get to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the tail end of this curve. Uh, if you look at say out of day eight here, the, there still is a 20% survival. What's happened there is at least that particular animal or those few animals survived because their immune system was able to fight off that infection uh, effectively. Uh, and so uh, being able to deploy the body's own immune system or to enhance the body's immune system is really important. Uh, and in particular, in lung infections, the reason that most of those animals are dying, uh, and if this is actually true for coronavirus too, as most of you know, uh, you, you have this massive 
uh, over response of the immune system. It's not that the bacteria are getting into the lungs and killing the, the, the animal. It's that the uh, inflammatory response of the, the body's immune system, when it senses that there's an infection in the lungs that basically gets overblown. Um, we, you, you hear this uh, term, the um, you know, cytokine storm. Uh, the response of the body is way overblown. Uh, and then the, you know, the, these animals die, again, particularly in a lung infection, they make, they're gonna die of an, a pneumonia type of, an, uh, of a, a condition based on the fact that their immune system just went overboard. And so um, one of the challenges in, in dealing with something like that is to try to basically shut down uh, the, uh, the immune cell response. And particularly we're gonna talk about these macrophage cells. So um, what we're gonna talk about in the next uh, couple of slides and giving an example of a nanotechnology material that we work with that is being designed and focused on treating uh, macrophage uh, infections, or uh, sorry, treating macrophages in uh, bacterially infected animals. And so again, what we're trying to do here is shut down that inflammatory macrophage response that's, that gives those animals such a hard time and makes them uh, die off. And so how do you do that? Well, you have to reprogram the macrophages. And we're gonna do that using a, a gene, a, a, uh, te technology known as uh, interference RNA, uh, siRNA uh, system. And what's shown in this slide is basically the roadmap for the, the rest of the, the 10 minutes or so I'm gonna be talking on, on how we've, uh, we've attacked this problem. There are a lot of challenges in trying to reprogram cells. Uh, we're gonna talk about the three main ones here. Uh, how do you get that uh, siRNA payload into a nanoparticle in the first place? Um, how do you get it to the cells in the right spot? And how do you get that, it to actually then elicit the siRNA response that would turn off those macrophages? Okay, so RNA interference has lots of challenges associated with it. And that has to do mainly with the body's own, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, programming that is, that is uh, you know, has driven uh, living systems to, you know, get rid of any kind of free RNA or DNA that happens to be showing up in the bloodstream. Uh, so you have uh, extracellular uh, barriers, uh, enzymes in your body that will degrade free uh, RNA or free DNA. Um, you have cells that will gobble up those uh, uh, nucleic acids if they are free in the bloodstream. Uh, and also those nucleic acids, if they don't get eaten up or destroyed, um, they still have a challenge in just getting into the cell. Uh, and once they get into the right region of the body, they still have to get into the cell. And once they get into the cell, and that's shown uh, kind of highlighted on the right-hand side of the slide here, is there's many cellular barriers uh, associated with uh, getting RNA to be effective. The main one that I'm gonna talk about today is this process of endocytosis. Uh, typically that's the, the, the cell's own self-defense mechanism uh, where if something gets into the cell, it encapsulates, it engulfs it, and the endosome, which then turns into a lysosome, degrades that uh, uh, nucleic acid or spits it back out, and then it can't be effective at doing what it's supposed to do in the case we're talking about here, reprogramming the macrophage cell. So let's first talk just briefly, I'm gonna introduce you a little bit about how we make our little nanoparticles uh, and how we get that nucleic acid in there. Um, and uh, we make our nanoparticles uh, based on a silicon system. And you see a little video playing here that shows how they're made. Those are silicon wafers uh, made from uh, the same kind of wafers that they use in the, in the computer industry. Uh, we process them electrochemically, we make them into a nanoporous structure. And you can see uh, and then in the, the, uh, the image here that's zooming in uh, in the SEM, the particles we finally uh, make are sort of small micro or nanoparticles, which have this very, very fine uh, nanometer scale structure in them. Uh, in the image you see at the very bottom here is a typical uh, image of the nanoparticles we work with. Um, they're very porous, they, so they have a capacity to carry a, a drug payload. Um, probably more importantly, at least that the first question you might ask is why would you even want to use silicon in the first place? Uh, silicon is a really interesting material, kind of like the albumin that I talked about at the beginning of my uh, presentation. It's a material that's present in the body already. Um, we eat a lot of silicon in our diets, our body knows how to handle silicon. Generally, you don't eat silicon like wafers, you eat silicon in the form of SiO2, uh, silica. 
and or silicic acid. And silicic acid is this compound shown on the right here, uh, SiOH taken four times. Uh, it's naturally present in your body. Your body, you actually have a lot of silicon in your diet. Your body knows how to handle it, knows how to excrete it. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily, generally doesn't accumulate in the body. So if you make a nanostructure out of silicon, once it starts to dissolve, uh, the body knows how to get rid of, of those dissolution byproducts. Okay, so that's the carrier. Um, and we want to think about how we actually get them directly into the cell. Um, they're going to be going into the cell uh, based on a, a, a fusogenic uh, coating that we put onto these things. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but the basic concept is, can you avoid that endosome uh, by putting the right kind of coating on the nanoparticle? Uh, and the, the schematics shown here, uh, it turns out that about 20 years ago, people were working with these materials called liposomes uh, as uh, delivery vehicles and uh, came up with formulations in the, in the lipid uh, that actually would not get taken up by uh, the endocytosis pathway, would not get um, swallowed by the cell, but would actually fuse with the cellular membrane as shown in uh, part C here. Uh, those are referred to as fusogenic uh, liposomes. Uh, they were kind of abandoned 20 years ago because the, the, the coating itself just didn't have a capability of uh, being selective. Uh, anytime they hit any cell, they would just fuse with it. And so it wasn't really a very effective approach. Uh, but what we, what we found is that if you take that uh, fusogenic liposome coated on a solid nanoparticle, it's more stable. And then you can also keep it from fusing with any cell by uh, placing a, a targeting group on that. And that's shown over the right here, a targeting peptide called CRV. So kind of those are the three components. Uh, we've talked just briefly about making that core and I've now given you a kind of a, a quick heads up on what we're doing uh, with the rest of the structure of this nanoparticle. So again, our chemical programming here is pretty sophisticated. Um, one of the ways that we condense the nucleic acid into those particles is using uh, a process that takes advantage of the fact that silicon dissolves in water. Uh, as it dissolves, it forms uh, silicic acid. We had known this for years and, and, and been looking at this process for a long time before we realized that you could actually take advantage of that uh, silicic acid uh, chemistry uh, uh, very specifically. Um, people who work with RNA know that uh, one of the ways to stabilize RNA is to mix in some calcium uh, citrate. Uh, calcium ion has a good capability of stabilizing RNA but in the case of the silicon system, it also forms a precipitate with uh, silicic acid. And so it kind of forms two, the calcium ions can perform two roles for us. Uh, one is it allows us to condense uh, and precipitate out uh, calcium silicate that seals our pores and seals our nucleic acid in there. And secondly, that calcium ion helps to stabilize that nucleic acid. Uh, some pictures here, I think just in terms of the time, I'll, I'll move on and just go give you just basic concepts. So when we finally kind of just to summarize this, when we do this con condensation chemistry, we can actually get a pretty high loading, a uh, very large percent of the siRNA directly into our nanoparticle. Uh, I talked a little bit about the fusogenic coatings to get them into the cell and get them to get into the cytosol without getting swallowed up by the endosome. And that last little piece that I talked about, um, the targeting groups, uh, are things that are developed by my collaborator, who's pictured up here, uh, Erki Ruizlotti. Um, and he works on uh, developing uh, small peptides that actually can specifically target uh, uh, nanoparticles to specific regions of the body. And I don't have time to talk about the technology that he uses. I just wanna put this up here to give him some credit for developing those uh, targeting groups that, that we use in this, uh, in this project. And so uh, in the end, uh, the process, I, I hopefully I gave you a little bit of a, a, a peephole into what we're doing here. Uh, we've got a silicon-based nanoparticle. We've sealed it with uh, our nucleic acid using this calcium silicate chemistry. We put these uh, fusogenic uh, coatings around that nanoparticle to make it uh, specifically uh, uh, fuse with the, the cell membrane and get into the, uh, the cytosol and deliver that nucleic acid in the proper spot. Uh, and then to get it really to go to the right cells, we use this targeting peptide. And Erki actually I invented and discovered a, a peptide that's very specific for macrophages. And so we take, took advantage of that peptide and it's referred to as CRV here. So kind of you take the whole thing and put it together. Um, these little particles can get uh, put into a Petri dish. They'll swim around in there. They'll uh, encounter the cell. And again, 
Um, they'll uh, bind to the cell surface and they spit their, their payload directly into the cytosol, into the cell interior without getting taken up by the endosome where then the siRNA can be much more effective at, uh, at, uh, at uh, inducing the response that we need in this, in this macrophage cell. Um, and then, um, so uh, the advantage of that is that we bypass this endocytosis process that would normally really inhibit the ability of the nucleic acid to, to do its function. And in this case, uh, reprogramming the macrophages so they're no longer inflammatory and shutting down that inflammatory response to help the animals cure themselves of the disease. And just finally, I'll just show a quick uh, image of, the, uh, of the, the results when we took these particles into animals. We have a mouse here that's been infected uh, with a Staph aureus uh, lung infection. Uh, a survival curve that I introduced uh, earlier to you uh, just shows the, uh, um, the survival of the animal as a function of time uh, for various different experiments. Uh, the black dots, dots here, you may uh, recall, uh, come from the, uh, uh, the original uh, disease. An animal, if they're not treated, they'll die off fairly quickly in this particularly deadly disease. Um, the green dots here are then that fusogenic coating with the, the, the targeting peptide and the correct uh, nucleic acid that can reprogram the macrophages to shut down that inflammatory response. And if we do all that, we find that we can actually uh, rescue these animals and they all survive uh, from, the, from the challenge. Um, we did a lot of uh, work in the backside that I haven't really talked about, just trying to figure out how these things really work. What do they really target? Uh, do they target effectively uh, macrophages over other types of cells? Where in the body are those macrophages being targeted? Uh, and so a lot of this is just being kind of swept under the carpet here. Uh, you can read the paper if you want. It's cited down at the bottom there to give you more information on that. Um, but we do know that these particles do selectively target macrophage and do selectively reprogram them. And then ultimately what we found is that this would actually then work. And so if you put the right chemical programming into a nanoparticle, you can get it to go to the right spot in the body. Uh, it can inject in the tail vein, it can circulate through the bloodstream, find the lungs uh, and shut down that macrophage response that was killing off the animals. So just in that quick vignette, I hope I kind of gave you some, at least a taste of the type of work we do in my lab. Uh, uh, we do a lot of chemistry, and I, I gave you one example of how we use this calcium silicate chemistry to both condense the nucleic acid and to seal the pores so that the nano construct is stable enough to be able to work. Um, showed how we can use uh, peptides to target them specifically to cells. Uh, even when they're circulating through the bloodstream, they'll find the specific cell types we're looking for. Um, these fusogenic coatings are really helpful in getting uh, the particle, once it docks with the cell surface, to get into the cell and be effective, and we showed that we could shut down an inflammatory response. So that just gives you a general concept of how uh, we look at uh, using nanoparticles to treat diseases. And again, I want to call back to this concept that uh, Isaac Asimov originally put out. Our nanorobots really have to follow those three rules. They have to degrade. They can't do, they have to be safe. They can do no harm. And once they've finished with their, their programming, uh, they go away. So with that, I uh, just want to acknowledge a few people. I, I mentioned uh, Erky Roslati already in my talk. Uh, Sengi Tapatia, who's also highlighted here, was really a, a key player in a lot of this, this work in our lab. Um, she's a professor at MIT, and a number of her students have contributed to this project. Um, and then the students are listed on the top. And I just have to then finally uh, thank and acknowledge my funding agencies for this work. And finally, I'll give you last picture of nanotechnology from Dr. Seuss's uh, Horton, here's a who. If you know this story, uh, you, you will realize that this is uh, a, a, an example of nanotechnology in the real world. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I have a lot of questions and I think there's some questions in the chat as well. First, First comment was Maxim from Moscow State. He says, hello, hi, Mike. Oh, hey, Maxim, <laughs> how you doing, Max? Um, and then the second question is from my buddy, Luke Weiss. He says, hi, Mike, thanks for the talk. Two quick questions. How much variability is there in the loading of RNA onto the particles? Also, do the release rates vary particle to particle? Those are both really good questions. Uh, first, uh, we do see variability. Um, you know, you have to do the chemistry right 
Uh, typically, we try to optimize this for very high loading, uh, ideally up to about 30% by mass. So 30% of that nanoparticle by weight is, is nucleic acid. Uh, we don't always get there. It depends on how you do the, the chemistry. But when you're doing the chemistry consistently, these materials behave pretty consistently. And we can pretty much get it, uh, you know, plus minus 5% uh, of loading. Uh, for the solid, uh, for the uh, release rates, um, you know, that's a really good question. And, and we haven't done any experiments where we took individual particles and watched them release. Um, we've taken different formulations and looked at their releases. And uh, generally from, if you make the same formulation or ostensibly the same formulation and it, and it specs out to the same size and so forth, uh, then the release rates are pretty consistent. Um, you know, typically without a fusogenic coating, if it's just a nanoparticle with the condenser chemistry, you put it into a buffer solution that releases within a few hours uh, with a fusogenic coating around it that tends to shrink wrap that nanoparticle, protects it a little bit, it'll last for a few days. Um, yeah, so there's some variability, but uh, if you, you know, follow the protocols properly and do, do it right, you get pretty reproducible results. Uh, Luke would probably be able to track the release from a single particle. I think that's his, <laughs> his forte. Okay, so Griffin Fields asks, why does having a solid core allow you to add targeting peptides to the liposome? Yeah, um, well, you could add targeting peptides to the liposome on its own, and people do that. So you can take the, typically what they'll, they'll do is they'll um, have one of the lipid components will have a polyethylene glycol, it will peg uh, linker on it, the distal end of that peg will have some chemistry, a malamide chemistry or something that allows you to attach uh, your targeting group that could be an antibody or in our case, a peptide. Um, so you could make just liposomes and have them do that and that would work and people do that kind of thing. Um, the nice thing about having a solid core we found is that liposomes are much more stable. They don't fall apart so easily. They, they don't leak out their payload. Having that solid core with a, with a nucleic acid trapped inside the particle keeps that nucleic acid inside the liposome. If you just put a solution inside the liposome, uh, it le leaks out or it can leak out. And so we found that these work a little bit more effectively than just bare liposomes. So Ofer Setter asks, hi, amazing work. Would it be possible to include these particles in an inhaled formulation? <laughs> That's a really good question. We've been wanting to move in that direction. Obviously, we're, we're looking right now at trying to pivot into COVID because you can imagine that, you know, you shut down the macrophage response in, uh, in, in any kind of a infection, bacterial or viral, uh, that inflammatory response kind of maps to either of those diseases. Um, and so, uh, you know, tailbane or IV injection is great, but if you get into the lungs directly, that would be fabulous. And um, we just haven't actually done any of those experiments. Uh, we've had, uh, don't have the expertise in our lab to do inhalation. We've started talking to groups that, that know how to do that. I'm working with an influenza uh, collaborator right now who has an in inhalation model. So we're hoping to go there. And that, that's a really important question, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. Do you think you'll see dam tissue ja damage from having na nanoparticles in the lungs or? That's a good, really good question too. Uh, you know, cause of course uh, that really goes back to the self-destructing aspect. If you look at the silicon particles that we make, there's silicon and oxygen. Um, you know, if you inhale glass or glass fibers that can be really bad. <laughs> uh, glass fibers won't dissolve in the, in, the, in the body typically and they can create really bad inflammation inflammatory responses. So it's really important that the form of the material not just have the right chemical formula, but it has to have the right nanostructured formula to allow it to thermodynamically, it wants to dissolve, but a, a, a fiber of glass kinetically is very slow to dissolve. If you make it into a nanostructure, it can dissolve more quickly. And that's really the key. Got it. Um, so Maxim first said, I think jokingly, um, when will self-destructing, self-targeting nanoparticles eventually evolve to sentient beings? But a more serious question, can we load anti-COVID drugs into nanoparticles and functionalize them to ACE2 receptors? Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. Uh, we've been looking at that. I mean, there's uh, already, uh, we have, you know, there are 
our systems that can target that receptor, uh, you know, so it seems like it would be an easy, uh, um, you know, an, an easy, easy uh, angle to take on that. Yeah. One thing that's nice about nanoparticles, you know, your, your body has different ways of clearing nanoparticles. They go through the liver, the spleen, uh, so-called MPS organs, but uh, also the lungs are a big uh, pathway for clearance of nanoparticles because the blood all flows through the lungs. And so, uh, Often you can get, you could imagine that uh, you may not even have to have any specific accumulation to get things to end up in the lungs. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Um, I have one last question, which is how fluorescent are these particles and will you use that property at all? I think that's cool. The cool yeah, that's, uh, the, that's another lecture. <laughs> so yes. um, we use that. Yeah, so silicon actually behaves like a quantum dot. Maxime is on the call here. He was, uh, yeah, he came to my lab as a summer uh, visitor. Um, I, by the way, if any of you guys online want to come visit San Diego for a summer, I do run a summer school every, every year. Uh, you can find it on my website. Um, and Max came for that. Uh, and, you know, uh, we looked at uh, um, his, one of his big focuses was trying to enhance the photoluminescence from the materials. Silicon is a quantum dot. It does emit, uh, you know, 20% to 40% quantum yield, not the brightest thing, but you can see it uh, in any kind of imaging system, the microscopes that we use to image animals, IBIS systems can pick it up. Uh, so we do use that to track the nanoparticles now and then. Uh, and this project, you know, we're mo more focused on just getting it to work, not necessarily tracking where it is. But if you look in that paper, you'll see that we use the photoluminescence as a way of identifying where the silicon is and whether it's intact or whether it's dissolved. Because when the quantum dots dissolve, their luminescence goes away. Got it. Okay, so just kidding. You have three more questions. <laughs> oh. Um, so SD, Esther Sagal asks, Regarding the inhalation of porous silicon, did you test different shapes of porous silicon? Uh, let's see. We did, well, in a sense, yeah, we, of course, we haven't done any inhalation studies. Just, I, I don't know if I, maybe I misstated on that. We'd like to go into that. We've got some collaborators who are interested in that, but we have not, you know, aerosolized uh, particles yet to, to see how, they, how effective they could be. Um, but we do look at different shapes. Uh, in, in particular, for the fusogenic systems, we found that what works better is to make very small 50 nanometer particles and have them cluster uh, rather than uh, using a single nanoparticle of 100 nanometers size uh, or 200 nanometers in size. Uh, and so smaller clusters tend to work better for loading larger nucleic acids as well. Uh, we're looking at some nucleic acids now that are actually too big to fit into the pores. And so just having them glue themselves together with the, the diaphanous structure of a nanoparticle seems to be more effective than actually, uh, you know, the, the kind of the pretty cartoon picture that I showed where you have a hole and the thing goes inside. So that's the most that we've done in terms of shape is more like the different size of the particles. Got it. That was also Jeff Coffer's question. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> so SD beat Jeff to the punch. Um, and so Ruben Acevedo said, great talk. Thank you for sharing. And I think those are all the questions for today. But wow. thank you, Mike. Thank you for being here and being with us. Yeah, thank you. Yes. And hopefully I can see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're all, any, every, you guys are all welcome to come visit San Diego once we're allowed to travel again. <laughs> One day. <laughs> yes. Well. And so next week we have Ashley Chapin from University of Maryland. She will be talking about hybrid platform development for in situ monitoring of, monitoring of the gut brain axis. So I hope you guys can tune in then as well. Thanks for being here today. Thanks a lot. <laughs>